Amen. Thank you, Brother Dalton. That was good this morning, wasn't it? I'm already, already, uh, and I'm already encouraged this morning. You sang well this morning. Appreciate you being here, and those who are visiting this morning, appreciate having you here this morning. And we're thankful what God's going to do here. We're looking forward to have Brother David Wood speak to us this morning. Well, I've just got to meet him this past weekend. We spoke on the phone a few times. Of course, Brother Treadway's working with him in the ministry. Though I've never met this man, but I've enjoyed the time I've spent with him. He is vibrant. All right, he has ideas. He has vision. And he is rare and ready to go. I don't know if before he came, he drank energy drinks and coffee. I don't know what happened. But he, I, or, or if that's just the way he always is, and that's what I think it is. And he has a love for God, a love for souls. And he wants to see God work. And I'm excited to introduce you, Brother Wood. You come and preach to us this morning, and you let God work through you. Thank you, sir. God bless you. Thank you. Well, it's a joy to be in Michigan. It's been a while since I have been in Michigan, and uh, we lived here for a while on the other side. And uh, it's a joy to be at First Baptist Church. I'll tell you, if you were able to sit still doing the music this morning, then you need a cup of coffee or you need something. <laughs> I'll tell you, fantastic. Amen? Amen? Just absolutely fantastic. Thank you, Pastor. I, have, I don't know if anybody so quickly I've gotten to kind of fall in love with as your pastor. And I met his family and I met many, many of you. And the staff of this church is fabulous. I'll tell you, for the entire conference and everything we did, and uh, I mean, everything was pre-thought, in advance, ready to go. I must say that I have a first-time visitor here today at your church, and I want to introduce him to you. He's Dr. Ted Gregg right here, down on the second row right here. And uh, he is the father-in-law to my son, which means he's helped keep my son straight all these years, and I owe him a debt of gratitude. I really do, so I am glad that you're here. It's good to see you this morning. And it's good to see many, many of you. God bless you. How many of you have your Bible? Hold your Bible up good and high. How many folks have a Bible with you? Isn't it a great thing to have the Word of God? Now, don't let it down so fast. Shake it a little bit. It's all right. The devil hates the Bible. And I always like to shake it to him a little bit and know them, let him know that we got it. If you got your Bible, turn with me to the book of Acts. And I want you to look at me with me this morning, a very familiar couple of verses in Acts chapter 16, the book of Acts chapter 16, Acts chapter 16. This morning, I'd like to speak on a subject that answers, I think, the most important question that any man or any lady can ask and get the biblical answer to, the most important life question that anybody will ever successfully answer according to the Word of God. Stand with me for the reading of the Bible, would you? And then remain standing for prayer. Then we'll be seated for God's word to our heart. The greatest gift that any man or any lady can ever have is the gift of eternal life. The gift of eternal life. The gift of salvation. There are three great Bible truths about salvation that every one of us ought to have anchored into our heart. They're Bible truths. Number one, everyone can be saved. It makes no difference what the background is, makes no difference what the educational level is, makes no difference how much they've already wasted or destroyed their life, everyone can be saved. Truth number two, everyone who is saved can know they're saved. Thank God we just don't have to guess about it. We don't have to go to bed at night, put our head on a pillar and wonder if we die are we going to wake up in heaven or hell? Everyone who is saved can just praise God and know they're saved. Truth number three, everyone who is saved can never lose their salvation. You can never lose it. That's a wonderful, wonderful thing for God's people to know. This morning, I'd like to introduce those verses that give that life question to you. Look with me at Acts chapter 16. And look with me at verse 31 and 32. Verse 31 gives us what the Bible says. Well, let's back up one verse to verse 30, where the Bible said, and brought them out. And then the Bible says, he asked the question, sirs, here's our question, what must I do to be saved? Now, to put you in context, this is what we call the Philippian jailer. We'll say more about him in just a moment. But this Philippian jailer brought out two preachers, and God has so dealt with his heart that he asked these preachers, Sirs, 
What must I do? It's personal, isn't it? What must I do to be saved? Then look at the next verse for just a minute. The Bible said in verse 31, And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love you this morning, and thank you for the privilege we had to be in this assembly, in this great church, to be able to bow our heads in your presence. Lord, I pray now the Holy Spirit would fall in our midst in power. I pray you give me what I need to say, God, exactly what you would have said for this hour. I pray for that man, that lady who's in this room. God, should they die, they would spend an eternity in a real hell separated from you. Good people, but God, they've never done the right thing with Jesus. Lord, I ask you from my heart, may not one person leave this building today without the Lord Jesus Christ. And then I pray for believers. God, you touch our heart. May we have a deeper love for you. May we have a greater understanding of the Bible. And we may move this morning to a greater service of you. And we'll thank you for that for us. In Jesus' precious name we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. And thank you. You may be seated. This is a great chapter in the Word of God. And I'm sure most of you understand that what had happened is that Paul and Silas, they had come to this area, and Barnabas being one of the companions they had in certain times on this missionary journey, and they began to preach the Word of God where they could. Now, there was a young lady, and this young lady was in her sin. And this young lady, empowered by Satan, began to give them a hard time, so to speak, and began to rail upon them. And the Bible said that Paul's spirit was stirred. His heart was hurt. And he was able to lead this young girl to Christ. The problem with the young girl getting saved, she could be compared to somebody today that got out from under drug control, somebody today that maybe had been in a homeless situation that had been put on top, maybe in areas of prostitution where her body was being wasted, and all of a sudden she was before the Lord, clean and forgiven, but all of a sudden those that made money from her occupation lost money. And they took it to the magistrates. The magistrates brought Paul, and he brought these two preachers in. They stood before them, and they put them in jail. Now, most of us would have said false charge. Most of us would have said, where's our attorney? But you read carefully, you'll find these two preachers began, they began to sing and they began to praise God for where God had put them. And they sang songs like Amazing Grace. And there was somebody that heard them, a jailer. And my dear friend, listen, every time we speak in public, there's somebody that we can influence, somebody that hears us. And all of a sudden, this jailer heard these guys down there talking about how they got saved, talking about how God had provided for them talking about how God had done great things. And I don't know the songs they would sing, but they were praising God. If you can imagine a, an environment in a jail, much like we had here this morning, doing this singing, and all of a sudden, somebody else heard. Somebody else always hears. God Almighty. And God reached down with the finger of heaven, and God began to shake the ground, and the doors of that jail began to open, and all of a sudden, the jailer upstairs drew out his sword, put the hilt of the sword on the ground, was going to fall on the sword and commit suicide and kill himself. You say, why would he do that? Under Roman law, that jailer was entrusted with the safekeeping of his prisoners. And under Roman law, if he lost those prisoners, they would execute him in public the next day, sometime even members of his family. And I'm sure what he was saying is, I better hurry up and exit myself and get this over with. But all of a sudden, before he could fall on his sword, he heard a voice. And the voice said, don't do yourself any harm. We haven't gone anywhere. He couldn't believe it. And these preachers came up, and he looked at them, and he asked the greatest question that I think any human being can ever successfully get the right answer to. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What must I do? to have that joy in my life? What must I do to have what I heard that you've got in your life? How can I have that in my life? And they very simply looked at him, and they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and like this, and thy house. Now, if you'll allow me to do it this morning, I'd like to do an examination of salvation. I'd like to take just a minute and talk about this. According to the Bible, what is salvation? What is this all about? How does a person enter into it? 
an examination of salvation. And I'd like to give you a couple of thoughts you might want to write down. They may help you in explaining this to somebody else or somebody else understanding what they can do and get the answer to that question. Thought number one is this. Think about it with me. Bible salvation. Now notice those two words with me. I did not say church salvation. I did not say denominational salvation. I did not say philosophical salvation. What I said is coming to God according to the teaching of God's Word and receiving Christ as one Savior and having our sins forgiven and going to heaven when we die. Folks, that's all involved in Bible salvation. And here's the thought. Bible salvation always, not sometimes, Bible salvation always begins with a desire. It always, not sometimes, it always begins with a desire. If I were to parade, parade people up here on this platform this morning and take one of these microphones and put it on a stand and I let everybody hear, we took the time to do it, that is saved, give a testimony. I could ask to every one of them, did God force himself upon you? What's the answer to that? No. God doesn't force himself on anybody. Now don't misunderstand, God wants everybody saved. Jesus died for everybody. And God said this in the Holy Bible. He said, Listen, I'm not willing that anybody should perish. God doesn't want anybody to die and spend an eternity in hell. But even though Jesus died and shed his blood for the sins of the world, he's waiting for every person individually to receive him. God doesn't force himself on anybody. In fact, most of us that are saved this morning would have to stand and testify at some particular time we had an opportunity to be saved but we turned it down. And then, thank God, God's a wonderful, long-suffering God. God gave us another chance, some of us another chance. How many of you are glad that God is always the God of a second chance? Isn't that a great thing to understand? I would think when anybody really understood what sin is all about, they would have a desire to be saved. May I ask you, do you have such a desire? Do you have a desire this morning to know that your sins are forgiven? If we had time to go back to Romans chapter 1, and I challenge you to do that very slowly at some time on your own and read the indictment of sin against what the Bible talks about, our culture, our world, and people without God, you'll find the answer to the question that people are asking across America today. And they say, what's wrong in our country? What's wrong in our country is this, folks. We've got a heart problem. What's wrong in our pro country is we've got, we've got an, a, a problem of our mind. We've got a mental problem. We've got another. And that is what we like, what our desires are like. And if you read Romans chapter 1, you're going to find the Bible says God gave them up, talking about their heart. Read a couple of verses later. God gave them unto vile affections, dealing with what their lusts were all about. And then you read down a couple of verses, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. May I tell you, the most expensive thing that you will ever try to enjoy in your life is sin, S-I-N. The problem of mankind, the problem in America, the problem in our lives is sin. But I want to tell you the answer is Jesus Christ. The answer is Jesus and what Jesus could do in a person's life. And I would think when anybody really understood what was happening in this area of sin and how deadly sin is. I meet precious teenagers. And sad to say, I could give you names and examples. It's heartbreaking, the great potential a teenager has, and then to see what drugs does to that teenager. It breaks the heart of parents. It breaks the heart of grandparents. It breaks the heart of caring people who work with people. I want to tell you, adultery may have a, a glimmer. It may have a desire. I want to tell you, lying, stealing, vile affection, whatever it may be, pornography, all of those things that are peripheral around, that are just accepted around today that are okay. I want to tell you, it's very expensive when you walk down the trail of sin. There's a grave price. In fact, the Bible says that at the end of the road, the wages of that sin is death. That's not only physical death, that is the second death, and that is an eternity in hell separated from God. I would think when everybody understood the penalty of sin, 
I would think they had a desire to be saved. May I ask you again, do you have a desire to know that your sins are forgiven? Do you have a desire to know that Jesus Christ not only has forgiven you, but you're going to spend an eternity in heaven with him and not an eternity in hell? Now pick it up, listen, Bible salvation always begins with a desire, thought number two. Bible salvation is activated, watch the word, it's activated by faith. Bible salvation is activated by faith. Look at what they told this man. They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Now look at that very carefully because I'm going to make a statement in a minute. I wish somehow that I could make across America to the point, if I had one platform where I could speak to the most people across our nation and give one great truth, I think it would be this. In order to be saved, faith is important. Are we together so far? In order to be saved, in order to come to Christ, in order to have our sins forgiven, faith is important, but watch. The object of our faith is of supreme importance. Notice they did not just say faith. They said your faith must be upon the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, there's a lot of faith preaching in religion in America today. A lot of faith preaching. But it's not faith in institutions that will save you. If institutional faith could save you, then all you got to do is join a church. You can join this church or whatever your preference may be or that church. Can I say to you, you can be a member of every church in the state of Michigan. But if you die without Christ, you're in trouble. Church membership will not forgive your sin. Church membership is not where it's at. Institutional faith will not save you. Then sometimes we say, well, maybe sacraments will save us. Can I say that faith in sacraments will not save you? Because salvation is not by works of righteousness, the Bible said. It's not by works of righteousness which men have done. So it is not sacraments. It is not faith in sacraments. Let's get a little closer to where we are. It's not faith in self-improvement that saves us. Did you pick that one up? We got in America what I call today bootstrap religion. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, we got, you know, guy standing here and he puts maybe leather underneath his shoes and put handles on his side and tries to pick himself up and get better and better. If I can make myself better and better, I'll eventually be good enough to be acceptable to God. The only problem is physics, if you'll apply it, you can never pick yourself up. I don't care how strong you are. And spiritually speaking, may I say, you can never save yourself regardless of how many good you may be in your own sight. Man's never good enough to improve himself enough to do it. It's not self-improvement. There's nothing wrong with a person trying to understand how to improve himself. It's nothing wrong with being positive. It's nothing wrong with a person doing all of these things that he can to take the gifts that God has given him and do a better job. But I'm going to tell you, it's not faith in yourself that will save you. I had a precious man when I was in Bible college. And while I was carrying a job, I worked with him. He had a German name, Seidenfaden. I tried to do ever, everything I could to lead Robert to Christ. Every time I'd witness to him, Robert would look at me and he'd say, David, I'll get good enough one day. I got a few more things to straighten up in my life. As soon as I straighten this up and straighten this up, I'll be, it'll work out for me. I'd come back to him and see him a couple days later. I'd say, how's it going, Robert? He said, pretty good. I said, are you good enough yet? Nope, not yet, but I'm getting closer. A couple days later, a couple days, it went by for two years. Finally, I graduated. I left that area. Robert never got saved. I went back to that area after I went to do evangelism. And this was some maybe 18 years later. And I was preaching in a church one night. And a man came forward and accepted Christ as his Savior. After the service, he came up to me and said, do you remember me? I said, help me out. He said, my name is Robert Seidenfaden. I said, Robert, wow. It's so good to see you. I said, you accepted Christ. He said, yeah, but in the process, I lost my wife. I lost my children. 
I've lost my health. He said, I finally understood. I'll never make myself good enough to be acceptable to God. Now look right at me. God knew that. That's the reason he sent his son, because he loves you. Nobody, I don't care, the best one among us. It's not faith in ourselves that'll save us. And let's see carefully, it's so important that we understand it's not faith in faith that will. Sometimes I wish it were. You cut this guy on television. He said, I'll tell you what, if you'll just say it and believe it, it'll become a reality. Boy, that sounds good, doesn't it? All you got to do is have faith in faith. I tried it one time. I got my checkbook out. And I looked at my checkbook balance, and I was disappointed. And I thought about that. I said, now, if I could just visualize it and have faith in it, it'll be a reality. So I visualized quite an amount. And then I said, faith. Then I called the bank, had the same thing I had when I started at Foolishness. <laughs> now, obviously, I did not do that. I'm trying to tell you, it's not visualization that will save you. It's not faith in faith that will save you. We have to understand, it is not faith that saves us, faith in the correct object. And I want to tell you, the Lord Jesus Christ, God's Son, came to this earth. He is the correct object. He is virgin born. He is sinless. He died on an old rugged cross. He shed his blood. They buried him to get rid of him. But thank God, three days and three nights later, the devil couldn't hold him down. And up from the grave he arose. And ladies and gentlemen, Jesus is not dead this morning. He's alive. Amen. You know what he wants to do? Take a person that is destitute, down, that doesn't know what way to turn, and turn that person around. And not only give them eternal life, but listen to this, he wants to give you a brand new life right now. Bible salvation, thought number one. Bible salvation, it begins with a desire. Thought number two, follow. It's activated by faith. I have one more. Bible salvation is consummated by personal reception. It's consummated, it becomes a reality by personal reception, individual reception. Listen to 1 John chapter 5. The Bible says of this, the Bible said, and this is the record. Boy, I love this passage. It's kind of like you could hold the Bible up and say, this is the record. Can I tell you, the devil's tried to destroy that record now for year after year after year. He's doing it now through trying to get it outlawed out of our kids and away from our kids and our schools. He's doing everything he can. The Bible said you need to understand this is the record. You say, well, what is God telling me in this record? Listen to it, 1 John chapter 5. This is the record that God has given unto us eternal life. It has to be a gift because we cannot deserve it or pay for it. It is the greatest gift that a person could ever receive from God Almighty. This is the record, now listen carefully, that God has given unto us eternal life. He that hath the Son hath that life. That's the reason in John chapter 1 it said, as many as received them, to them gave he the power, the authority to become children of God. He that hath the Son hath eternal life. Here's where I was. But he that hath not the Son of God hath not eternal life. I was not raised in a Christian home. I thank God for those who were, but I was not. My dad was a drunkard, and I thank God for the things he taught me and the influence he had on my life. There were eight children at our house, and I don't want to tell you how bad it got at certain times. I will tell you the one thing I want to do is get away from home. My precious mom, how she took care of things, I'll never know. I remember now how man, mom would get us up on Sunday morning. She'd say, now, wipe us off with a wash rag and dress us the best she could, stand us in line. And we had to walk and said, I want you to walk to the Baptist church, the church I went to. I'm sure they were very wonderful people. It was a Baptist church, but nobody taught salvation. Nobody taught you need to receive Christ. They had what I call today church entity. It's what I talked about a minute ago, institutional, you know, faith. Just so you're right with the church, everything is all right. So when I was about 11 years old, they came to me and they told me as a young lad, they said, Dave, said, if you'll just come down and present yourself for membership, you're ready now to become a member of this church. And I thought that's pretty good. I'd never been before church and 
I always had to kind of sit at the back. So I came down and stood at the front, about three or four others, tried to hold my shoulders back, said, whoa, I've come as a candidate for membership. And the preacher announced we have candidates for membership today. They ran me through some classes. I'm sure they said a little bit about the Bible. I don't really remember. They told me more about what the church was like and what the church believed and what it meant to be a church member. And so I went through some classes, a few things like that. I must have passed all right because a few weeks later they brought me back before the church, had me stand down there again and said I had successfully completed the classes. Then four weeks after that, they baptized me. After they baptized me, I came back up and I was a candidate, you know, a candidate seeking, a course completed, baptized member of a Baptist church. You say, well, good. Then if you'd have died, you'd have gone to heaven. No, had I died, I'd have gone to hell. I was a member of the church, but nobody ever told me I needed Jesus Christ as my Savior. You say, what happened when you got baptized? Not a real problem. I went down a dry center and came up a wet center. <laughs> Not a real problem. It didn't happen. When I was 19 years old, I had finished one year of college, trying to get in something that I could make as much money as I could and get away from what I was brought up in. And a preacher named Jerry Falwell crossed paths with me. And I'll be honest with you, I'd learned by then how to scare Christians to death. All you gotta say is I'm an atheist. It scares people to death. And the first time he talked to me, he walked up to me and began to talk to me about how my dad had been into drinking and how that God was the answer. And he was talking to me about church and I said, whoa, I don't want anything to do with this. I'm an atheist. He looked at me and started laughing. I said, what are you laughing about? He said, you're not smart enough to be an atheist. <laughs> I liked him. I did. I liked him. So I went to church, heard him preach two weeks later, sitting on the second row in that Baptist church. I got up and came down and put my faith in Jesus Christ. The week after that, God called me to preach. You look at me this morning, you say, preach, you don't understand. Don't understand what? Well, my parents are Christians. I was raised in a Christian home. Well, thank God for that. But I'll tell you, you're not going to heaven because your dad and mom's a Christian. You must individually yourself place your faith in Jesus Christ. You must do that. You say, well, preacher, you don't understand. <laughs> I'm a member of the church. I just, I just been it all my life. I've been a member of the church. Hey, listen again. You can join every church in this state, every church in America, and your church membership is not a ticket to heaven. It will not get you into heaven. It's not church membership. You say, preacher, <laughs> but I've been baptized. Hey, folks, the power's not in the tub. The power's in the blood of Jesus Christ. That's where the power is. You say, well, I've been a Christian all my life. You don't understand. I was born into Christianity. I was born into the church. I was born into a Christian home. Hey, you can be born in a garage and that doesn't make an automobile out of you. Amen? <laughs> it's not where you're born. Thank God for good environments. Thank God for people who love you. But it's when you come to a certain point where you're willing to say individually, I've received Christ. And I mean business about it. Right above Boston, a little bit over 15 years ago now, there was a trial that took place. The young man on trial was 22 years old. The charge was first degree murder. If I can back you up three years before then, when he was 19 years old, he rebelled against his parents, chose his own path, laughed at his dad and mom, became rebellious, and was living for the devil, nowhere near living for God. One night, while he was drinking, he came around a sharp curve, lost control of his car, went off the road, and landed in the middle of a river, broke ice to go into the river. He did what he could to get the door open, but he couldn't. The water started coming in, and he knew he was going to drown. And all of a sudden, the door jerked open, and a strong arm came in and went around him and pulled him out of the car, and he began to make his way back to the bank. He didn't think a whole lot about it, didn't know much about the guy that pulled him out of the car. Three years later now, he had been living that reckless life, living for the devil. It deteriorated 
until he got caught after he had shot someone. The jury deliberated, left, listened to the evidence, the prosecution of the defense had both presented their case, and the jury came back, and the verdict was guilty, first-degree murder. The judge called for the young man to come stand before him. The young man came and stood right down before him. The judge looked at him and said, Son, you've been found guilty of first-degree murder, and he sentenced him to death. When he said the word death, the young man came apart. He began to scream, How could you do this to me? Don't you recognize me? Don't you know who I am? And the judge looked down at him. He said, Son, I'm afraid I really do not know what you're talking about. What do you mean who you are? He said, sir, three years ago, you jumped into the water and risked your own life. A judge was a former Olympian trial swimmer and you came over and ripped the door open and pulled me out and you saved my life three years ago. Your Honor, I don't understand. How could you have saved my life three years ago and sentenced me to death this morning? The judge was quiet for a minute. Then he looked at him and he said, son, Three years ago, I was your savior. But this morning, I'm your judge. Can I say this? Everything in the Bible, every truth in the word of God backs up the fact God wants to be your savior. Jesus wants to forgive your sin. But if you reject him and turn him down and die without him, one day, You'll stand before him. He'll be your judge. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. Let's pray, can we? Heads about and eyes are closed, and God's speaking to hearts. Every head is bowed, and every eye is closed for just a moment. I'm going to ask, please, that no one leave unless it's absolutely necessary that our heads about. I want you to spend a private minute with God as if you were the only person in this room. Would you do that? Just spend a private minute with God as if you were the only person in this room. Now here's the question. Listen to it very carefully. Here's the question. If something should happen and you should die today, if something should happen and God should take your life today, where would you be tomorrow? Where would you be tomorrow? Would you be in heaven or would you be in hell? heaven or hell? Please answer that question very sincerely. Heads about and eyes are closed all over the building. How many of you in this building right now will say, Preacher, if I should die today, I'm 100% sure that when I die that heaven's my home. I have placed my faith in Jesus Christ. I know that he has saved me. I'm 100% sure if I should die today, I know for sure that when I die, I'm going to heaven. If that is your testimony, well, on every head is bowed and every eye is closed, would you lift your hand right where you are for just a moment? Please do not lift it unless you know it for sure. Please don't. This is the reason the head's about. I, won't, I, I, I will not embarrass you. I think you know that by listening to me. You can let your hand back down. Thank you. I want to thank you for your honesty. You say, what do you mean? I want to thank you who did not lift your hand. I want to thank you for being honest. Now listen very carefully. If you could not lift your hand a moment ago, you say, I am not 100% sure if I die, I'm going to heaven. But God has touched my heart. God has touched my heart. And preacher, I'd like to know that for sure one day before it's too late. One day before it's eternally too late, I would like to know for sure I'm going to heaven. Would you allow me to pray for you? I will not come where you are. I'll not point you out. But if you'd let me, I'd surely like to pray for you. How many of you in this building right now, in the back, front, left, right, it makes no difference, would say, Preacher, God has touched my heart. I could not raise my hand a moment ago. I'm not 100% sure that when I die, I'm going to heaven. Please pray for me. Hold your hand up good and high, quickly, right where you are, all over the building. Thank you, ma'am. I see your hand, and I'm waiting for somebody else. Anybody in the building, in the back, front, if I don't see your hand, God will. I'm waiting for others for just a minute all over the building. If I were to die today, I'm not 100% sure I'm going to heaven. Here's my hand. Please pray for me. Lift it up good and high right where you are, all over the building. Good and high all over the building. Now, I'd like you to look at me, if you would, for just a moment, would you? Everybody look right at me for just a moment. I'm so thankful for you who lifted your hand. But I want to tell you again, 
I don't want anybody to leave this building without knowing for sure about heaven. There are four things we need to know in order to know we're going to heaven. Number one, we need to know that we've sinned against God. God, you're right. We've sinned. We're sinners. Number two, we need to recognize that the penalty of that sin is death and an eternity in hell separated from God. What a terrible penalty. But that is the wages of our sin. That's where sin takes us. Number three is the good news. The good news is that Jesus Christ died on the cross and paid that penalty for all of our sin. Can I say this? When he was on the cross, you were on his mind. He paid the penalty for your sin. One more thing. The Bible said if we'll believe that and receive Christ, God will save us. Now I want to ask you three questions. I'd like you to answer that question aloud as a congregation with a yes or no, good and loud. Question number one. This morning, do you believe that Jesus Christ is really the Son of God? Yes. Question number two. Do you believe that when Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood, he paid the sin debt for the whole world? Yes. Now the other question is a personal question. Do you believe that when Jesus died on the cross and paid the sin debt for the world, that he paid your sin debt for you? Yes, he did. And as I indicated, the Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I want to help you to do that. Let's bow our heads in prayer for just a moment, can we? And if you're not 100% sure, you who lifted your head, you who did not, but you're not 100% sure that if you die, that you're going to heaven. I want to invite you to pray this prayer right where you're seated. You say, you mean God can save me this morning? Absolutely. God can forgive my sin right where I am? Absolutely. If you'd like to receive Christ as your Savior, I want you to pray this prayer with me. I'll pray it aloud. You can pray it aloud if you like or softly in your heart. Just pray with me. Say, dear God, dear God, I know that I'm a sinner. I've sinned against you, God. God, please forgive my sin. God, I invite you into my life. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he died, paid the penalty for my sin. And right now, God, I want to receive him as my Savior. And I mean it with all of my heart. Now, our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. How many of you prayed that prayer? While heads are bowed, lift your hand right where you are prayed that prayer with me and you meant it. Hold your hand up all over the building right where you may be. Thank you. God bless you. I'm looking for others for just a minute. Just looking around. Thank you. Now the pastor is going to come and invite you to make that decision public and as Christians to have a deeper love for the Lord. Let's leave here today thanking him for the greatest gift we can ever have. Preacher. In a moment, we'll stand to our feet. We'll invite you. If the Lord's touched your heart to come forward. If you've prayed that prayer and you meant that, we'd love to rejoice with you in that. We'd love to give you some material that help you grow as a Christian. If you've trusted Christ and you've never followed the Lord and been scripturally baptized, we'd love to talk to you about that today. You can come forward. There's some men at the front. If you've been baptized and you've asked Jesus to save you, been saved and never joined a good church. We'd love to talk to you about that as well. The Lord bless this invitation. Help us to respond to the way we ought to. In Jesus' name, amen.